everybody, I'm Biebs Kelly. Welcome back to another video. Today we are taking a look at something that has absolutely dominated the headlines for years now, and that is the feud between Prince William and Prince Harry. It's something that has captivated the public and fascinated the media, with journalists oscillating between figuring out who's to blame and hoping for reconciliation that seems very far off. This rift seems to be particularly fascinating in part because it involves two of the most famous men out there. Also, it involves family dynamics, which everybody is at least somewhat familiar with. But what is it that's the true core of this problem? What are the factors that have continued this rift and expanded the chasm between the brothers? There are a number of themes that have been present between these brothers' relationship way back from the start that have seemed to only snowball and gotten worse over time. One of those being resentment. Since the release of Prince Harry's book, Spare, we learned directly from Harry just how haunted he has been by his birth order. One of those things nobody can help. Me personally, I was the youngest. I liked some parts of it. I disliked other parts of it. I think it contributed to my competitive nature quite a little bit, but now I'm glad to be the youngest. It obviously has a lot more layers to it when it comes to Harry than it does for most of us. But look at Princess Anne. She was technically the spare, but was skipped over in the line of succession in a rule that has since been changed. And she is far more well-adjusted to it than Harry. This has really shown Harry's immaturity, his lack of development, and it's obvious that he has used it as both a crutch and an excuse for some of his bad behaviors or choices. Clearly, he not only resented being the second born, but also resented William, which is also immature and unfair. Because just as Harry cannot help his birth order and needs to learn to accept it, Prince William also didn't choose his birth order and has come to accept it. Instead, with Harry, it has really consumed him. It's colored every facet of his life, it would seem. He's really steeped in this resentment, and unfortunately, his partner, rather than inspiring him to forge his own path and encouraging him towards his own interests and a useful life, she encouraged Harry's bitterness instead. A second theme that we can really see stand out between these brothers is jealousy. Despite some headlines creating this really weird fabricated alternate universe where William has even a grain of jealousy towards his brother, what's been clear since they were children is that Harry has been very jealous of William. This sort of cloud of jealousy seemed to have only grown as they aged. We can see it when they're children here in these types of pictures where Harry was very possessive of Diana in photographs. Many said that he acted jealous of William and that Diana spoiled him. As they approached adulthood, William had successes in school. He became a pilot. He did admirable work as a search and rescue pilot. While Harry struggled to pass his exams, couldn't become a pilot, and didn't really achieve anything significant. This has further fueled his jealousy that he has this sort of lack of achievement. And this also eventually contributed to his haste when it came to his relationship with Meghan. It's no secret that Harry seemed to really like Catherine quite a bit. William and Catherine seem to have a very healthy relationship, a happy home, three beautiful children. Catherine is successful in her role within the monarchy and has a good relationship with her in-laws and with her own family. Harry didn't really have any of those things. And so whatever version of events you believe about how Harry and Meghan got together, for those who don't know, there were pregnancy rumors as to why they had to rush the wedding, things like that. But also Harry sped things along in part due to that jealousy. Jealousy of what William had and the erroneous idea that if only Harry had a wife and children, that his role within the family would somehow be elevated. The impression is that he thought if he had a Catherine that his role would be more solidified and expand. He would gain more prominence and significance. And temporarily, he did get a lot more attention. He was going through a whole batch of firsts. His first engagement, marriage, wedding, his first child, his first tour with Meghan, he and Meghan's first joint engagements, things like that really do captivate the public's attention. But even still, he was placed behind William and Catherine and their family on balconies, when leaving places, on lists, on journalists' priorities of who to photograph. And that level of disappointment was surely difficult for him to grasp that 
ultimately, no matter what, he was never going to come first at any given point. Granted, one would assume he would have outgrown that sort of a fantasy by the time he reached adulthood, but evidently not. A third theme we can see is frustration, and this is one that's unique because unlike jealousy and resentment that really just went one way from Harry towards his brother, frustration we see going both ways between these brothers. It was William who suggested Harry take his time getting to know Meghan. And again, he was right, but Harry took offense to this and saw it as a slight or a criticism of his own judgment. This is what a lot of journalists cite as one of the earliest points that this particular rift that is so big and we see going on today began. There are other elements to their relationship that could have contributed and certain rivalry sort of vibes that have always been there. But this particular rift that has caused this huge number of years and huge distance between them and lack of communication is a totally different beast. And a lot of journalists pinpoint this, this moment in time where William said, hang on, maybe you should slow down with Megan, as the initial seed planted that then grew into this big rift. But we'll circle back to that a little bit later. It really frustrated Harry to have this sort of advice from William. In fact, Harry wasn't the only one frustrated. William and others were frustrated with Harry too, for his paranoia, his unreasonable demands, his public statements that became increasingly emotional and irrational. He was making himself and others look bad just because he had feelings at any given time. And this was a tendency that for whatever reason, Harry really felt emboldened to escalate after he got with Megan. No one can really ever remember any statements, especially not surprise statements coming from Harry specifically before the stop picking on my girlfriend statement that he released early on in his relationship with Megan. And that statement was really, really empty and, and came across as very emotional because there was no evidence of any sort of harassment or following Megan around or anything like that. It just wasn't happening. And that's in part likely why the palace went ahead and quietly deleted that particular statement off their website because it wasn't backed up by reality. Because this trend really began when Harry met Megan, a lot of people place blame on Meghan for Harry's sort of public complaining. Royal family or not, no one wants their private family disagreements or private family conversations to be aired in public. And Harry has been encouraged to do this ever since he and the Meg became a couple. An additional layer to the brothers' relationship that's really complicated has to do with Diana and her legacy. The memory of their mother is something that will always tether the brothers together, but has also caused great strain between them. Harry has really made the loss of his mother a massive part of his identity. It's one of the main things he talks about and features whenever he is given a stage of any kind, whether it be a book, an interview, TV spot, he's always tying in references to his mother. This being a childhood trauma, most professionals within the mental health community would advise against that childhood trauma becoming such a big part of your identity. Harry has really clung to it though, and he uses it as a crutch for some of his choices and an excuse for some of his mistakes. But generally speaking, having a trauma grow into a dominant part of one's personality or identity can really inhibit your ability to move forward, to grow, to heal from it, and to find healthy ways to acknowledge that trauma because you're almost putting a roadblock to expanding past it. And while it seems that Harry was already sort of on that path before Megan came along, there is no question that Megan continued to pick at that scab once she entered Harry's life. According to many well-placed sources and verified stories, Meghan Markle did really manipulative things when it came to using Diana's memory in her relationship with Harry. Doing things like wearing Diana's perfume, studying her mannerisms, attempting to emulate Diana in many ways, even taking pictures that are near identical or wearing outfits that are identical to those that Diana did. 
She has even taken it to a rather sinister level by telling Harry that she communicates with Diana's spirit. This is plainly unhealthy. And this is a touchy subject. If you believe in this sort of a thing, and hypothetically, if Diana were communicating with Megan from beyond the grave, wouldn't the right thing to do be for Megan to tell Diana to communicate with Harry directly? And because in a situation like this, it creates a bit of a power imbalance in a way, it's just really twisted and complicated. Because Megan could say whatever she likes if she is the one exclusively in contact with her mother-in-law in this hypothetical situation, if we were to believe it, that means she can use it as a manipulation tactic, which would be super unkind. Alternatively, if that were happening, she could simply say nothing at all because of that awareness that it could create a weird dynamic. It could create a situation where he's questioning things, questioning her, her honesty about this, all of that. So it would get really messy really fast. So simply not saying anything about it would be a better path forward as well. Because what this sounds like is triangulation, which is super toxic. And it's even more weird to be triangulating with somebody who has passed away. Inserting yourself into your spouse and their parents' relationship is never a healthy thing. Even less so and more weird, given that Princess Diana is no longer with us. It's just such a bizarre claim. If, on the other hand, you don't believe that sort of a thing, then it's easy to see just how twisted and, and weird and unhealthy this really is. In contrast, Prince William, who also lost his mother at a young age, clearly dealt with it in a much healthier manner. And it would be natural for him to be very tolerant of his brother's path, relationship with his mother's memory, things like that because he would be understanding to the pain and turmoil that his brother's going through and would be understanding to giving Harry the space to process all of that as he sees fit. However, Harry has brought Meghan into that dynamic unfairly. Even if William was annoyed with Harry's approach up until this point, once Meghan became involved, the copying of outfits, the comparisons, Harry's constant references to parallels between Meghan and Diana that are simply not there or are fabricated and intentional, Harry even wanting everyone to believe and confirm that Meghan is so much like Diana when no one sees it. Not even the Spencer family agreed with him when he made this claim. Meghan saying she speaks to Diana. These are the things that really cross the line, that cross that boundary to where it's become unhealthy and toxic. And it is unacceptable for William to have to put up with that. It's become so public as well that it's very offensive to William and it's begun to tarnish Diana's legacy. It's twisted it up into a different version that's woven with Harry and Meghan's antics rather than letting her legacy and memory be her own and that of both of her sons. Sources close to William have reported that he is very tired of and bothered to see so much from the Sussexes about his mother, Diana. Comparison that's nonsensical and simply put, unfair to everyone else who loved Diana. For Harry and Meghan to try to commandeer her memory, to take ownership of it in any way, which is what they've been doing, is simply unacceptable. So this is another element that has really escalated since Meghan entered the picture and has contributed to the brothers' rift and tensions. So when did this drama, this particular drama, actually begin? A well-placed source says that the drama actually began around the holiday season of 2018, where Harry had gotten angry with William, saying that the family, and William in particular, hadn't been doing enough to include Meghan in the family. The source said that Harry felt William wasn't rolling out the red carpet for Meghan and told him so. They had a bit of a fallout, which was only resolved when Charles stepped in and asked William to make an effort. And that's when the Cambridges, at the time, now the Waleses, invited the Sussexes to spend Christmas with them. This was a few months after the wedding, and as you'll recall, Harry and Meghan had been doing lots of things sooner than tradition for the newly married in persons. Also, William had his own job, life, three children at this time. It certainly isn't up to him. In my personal opinion, it's up to the spouse to make sure that they are building a bridge between 
their new partner and their family. Creating that in-law relationship or, or setting a stage for that in-law relationship to flourish. It's really up to the spouse, the, the newly married person, to organize get-togethers, to host some things, because after all, that person in this situation, Harry, is the only person who knows both parties. Harry knows the royal family, his brother, all of them, they're his family. And Harry knows Meghan the best out of all of them. So really it was up to Harry to take that responsibility of creating situations where Meghan could get to know the family better to bring her around and introduce her and try to build those bridges and help her to find things in common with these people because he's the one who knows them all. So it's his job to be the glue. And that's the same in any situation. It's the spouse's job to bring their new partner and their family together and make that in-law relationship have a good chance. So ultimately, Harry was really kind of booting his responsibility to act as a bridge builder for his new wife and his family. So that's, you know, nothing new there that he was kind of punting the responsibility away. But this was Scarfgate Christmas. Perhaps in their Christmas together, there were a handful of awkward moments courtesy the Meg. With the way that children don't really warm to her and the Cambridges had three young children, Prince Louis was a baby. Combined with the way she looks at William, I can understand how the scarf ended up getting all the attention in this scenario. However, the Times reported that initially the brothers fell out much earlier than the Meg came along. The brothers disagreed over animal conservation in Africa. William believes you should focus on community-led schemes where local people over time feel empowered to protect the land. Harry, on the other hand, was more interventionist. He felt that you need a more hands-on approach to ensure wildlife habitats were securely protected to enact change quickly. To me, though, that sounds like a more run-of-the-mill argument. It was more in the work disagreement category, so I'm not sure that that really justifies blaming it as the start of this rift we see here and now today. However, it is indicative of the fact that William, perhaps with more thoughtful and pragmatic approach, or however you want to look at it, did tend to take the right approach to these sorts of issues, while Harry had other ideas the frustration grew when his ideas turned out to not be necessarily the right path. For example, in this scenario, William clearly was right. Despite it being clear that Harry has always had a lot of anger towards William and is rather disagreeable in general, the conservation situation I don't think sounds like a big enough problem to be responsible for the feud the way the Megan problem has been. Because it's been so ongoing and ever-present, unlike the work situation. But setting that aside, clearly Prince William was right about his approach to conservation in Africa because Africa Parks and Prince Harry's approach has resulted in a huge scandal. Meanwhile, Prince William's approach makes much more sense. When locals are supported to work towards protecting their lands and wildlife and are funded, have resources and training provided, then they are able to actually shift the culture towards conservation of wildlife and it empowers the communities to support the cause for generations to come with greater independence, which is also more sustainable over time. Rather than having randos come in and take over a la Prince Harry's method, which has turned out to be disastrous for the locals. Harry later alluded to Prince William and Catherine having biases towards Meghan that created boundaries towards building a relationship. We're talking about that in an upcoming video, so be sure to subscribe so you do not miss it. Following that Christmas, though, William became increasingly frustrated with Harry's approach during and around the time and following Archie's birth because of Harry and Meghan's over-the-top antics. Keeping things like the christening and the godparents private, William felt they were going overboard, and he was annoyed by this. The public is somewhat split on this. Some people believe that they're well within their rights to keep as much private as they possibly can and want to. And there are obvious positives to keeping your children out of the spotlight whenever you can. And that part of it is completely understandable. However, it gets very sticky and becomes problematic when the people in question are working royals, at the time bankrolled by the public taxpayers, and titled. 
At the time, Harry and Meghan's entire life was funded by taxpayers, and they had the titles of Duke and Duchess of Sussex. So it does make sense to give concessions when it comes to privacy for that role. And the public investment in people in that role is part of what makes the relationship work. With no access and what seemed like snooty privacy demands, the relationship crumbles pretty quickly as we have seen. Once they gave up the taxpayer-funded lifestyle and became private, moved away, quit working with the royal family, fine. Up until the point that they continued to use their titles for their gain and even took titles for those kids that they don't offer the public any opportunity to know. And that is the problem. And no one understands that balance better than William. So I totally take his side. I know, big surprise. The next big stirring of problems came in the summer of 2019. Rumors were that the brothers were keen to put their differences aside, especially to honor their late mother's birthday. However, by fall, Prince Harry had decided to go scorched earth mode and he burned all his bridges to smithereens and to use his aggressive turn of phrase, sacrificed his entire family on his and Meghan's PR altars. Harry gave the Bradby interviews during the South Africa tour. Check out our three part series on their South Africa tour. I will link it here if I can and in the description box for you. He said that he and his brother were indeed on different paths and essentially said that he was feuding with his brother. Prince William's reasonable, compassionate, normal approach was to schedule an emergency meeting with Harry to meet face to face and talk about this and figure out what the heck is going on. By all accounts, the royal family was blindsided by this, but Harry backed out due to being paranoid that the palace or the press would find out. The critical thinking question we are left with here is, so what if they found out? Why would it matter if the palace, staff, courtiers, press, journalists, paparazzi, who cares? Why would it matter if anybody knew that Harry and William, two brothers, got together to talk? How would that be a bad thing? This is just one of the earliest signs that Harry and Meghan were on some completely bizarre mission to make everything under the sun weird. The speculation is that Harry and Meghan have a very toxic relationship and that their dynamic is not a healthy one. It's a pattern that we all have commonly seen from time to time in our day-to-day -day lives. A large percentage of the public recognized it for what it was. In a toxic dynamic, to put it simply, a partner may fuel the other's anxiety about things, relationships, workplaces, whatever it is, which can result in very irrational behaviors, it can result in isolation, the breakdown of literally every other relationship. So at this point, the tasteless and manipulative airing of public grievances from two of the most privileged people on the planet began. And understandably, after Prince Harry rejected Prince William reaching out in a healthy manner, the feud turned into a rift. After the whole Megxit drama occurred, Harry and Meghan further drove a wedge between them and the royal family with their Oprah interview. They also did major damage to their own reputations at that time. This was really one of the biggest missteps for them in so many ways. Immediately upon airing, there were 17 proven lies from Meghan Markle mostly, but also from Prince Harry. And that number has grown to 30 by some investigative journalists' accounts. That backfired hugely for them, so much so that Oprah tried to bury the interview and try to eliminate it from viewership within a month of it airing. Within days, Gail King went on TV to say that she reached out to Harry and Meghan, who said that they had indeed spoken to William and Charles, but the conversations were not productive, and for Harry and Meghan, they still feel there are false stories being published that are defamatory to the Meg. And that is what they're upset about, according to Gail. For William and Catherine, and even the wider royal family, this was truly beyond the pale. For example, Richard Eden has pointed out that for Catherine in particular, who has only ever given one true interview, her engagement interview with William, to have family members speaking about private conversations and drama would have been unfathomably appalling to her and stressful. The Oprah interview fallout was so huge, it would warrant its own video. But the aftermath was apparently quite surprising only to Harry. 
He and the Meg continued to send navel-gazing letters to members of the royal family and put out statements in the months following that rehashed the drama and how wronged they were and felt. Harry was surprised that this did not cause the royal family to come to him, to grovel, to apologize, to ask what they could do to fix whatever it was that he was upset about. He was shocked that that wasn't their response. And this is very familiar to members of the public, to normal people who have been in similar situations where somebody's throwing a tantrum over something that's rather small or insignificant. They can't calmly articulate what it is that they're upset about and pinpoint the real problem because they're just being emotional. And this is proven to be the case here because Harry and Meghan have completely avoided any private constructive meetings to bring forth their concerns and grievances in a healthy way, which does include privacy for all parties involved. Instead, they've made vague and big complaints, a public hissy fit, demanded apologies, and are not telling anybody what for. Likely because they don't actually have anything that they can pinpoint to be upset about and say, I would like an apology for this. Ultimately, if you can't actually put together a complete sentence that clearly states what exactly you are upset about, that's calm and direct and factual, then you're just having big feelings and that's okay to admit. Perhaps the other party didn't actually do anything wrong and you just took it wrong. If you can't put it into a clear message, then you may be overreacting. Because if somebody really did wrong you and did something that is generally morally or socially unacceptable, you should be able to state it. Since Harry and Meghan have been unable to do that and are unwilling to do so privately either, which is mutually respectful, people have completely lost respect for them and no longer believe them. And Harry and Meghan didn't stop there they continued to chisel away at the rift with spare. The cut interview, the Netflix series especially, but even smaller projects and interviews as well. These batch of projects seem to be the final straw. And I'm not confident necessarily that if it were just Oprah, Harry and Meghan would have been able to create a path back. But the fact that they continued their complaint campaign, taking things to a point where they can no longer repair the relationship no matter what. After some of these projects came out, sources close to the royal family said that the royal family is disappointed by Meghan Markle's latest comments in The Cut magazine and on her podcast. They are distressed that after stepping back from the royal family, claiming a need for privacy, she continues to publicize family matters in public. You can't really argue with that. It comes in at a close second after recollections may vary. The source also added that there's a loss of trust, obviously. Really, as I've said before, no matter the complaints, there was no good reason for Harry and Meghan to take it public like they did. That just seems malicious, petty, spiteful, mean-spirited. Honestly, they wouldn't have had any juicy content worth Netflix or Spotify's money if they hadn't stepped into dramatics because they're, quite honestly, pretty boring. But they did so at the expense of their family. Their family feels that they were sacrificed for Harry and Meghan's money, for Harry and Meghan's attempt at popularity, which has failed. Which begs the question, what was it for then? It ultimately didn't work, Harry and Meghan's plan. It only served to make things worse for Meghan and Harry and completely damage their relationships. It has become increasingly clear that the royal family have done nothing offensive at all to the Sussexes, which is exactly why the brothers cannot reconcile. It's also why the public has rejected the Sussexes so harshly. The final real big element between Harry and William's rift comes down to Catherine. For whatever reason, Prince Harry turned his spiteful sights on Catherine. He and the Meg began targeting Catherine in terms of press piggybacks, meaning whenever Catherine delivered a speech or had something important in the news or attended an event or got an award or praise or whatever from anybody for anything, or it was her birthday, Harry and Meghan timed a release to try to share or steal the spotlight to some extent. But even worse, Harry, on Netflix, clearly implied that William only married Catherine because she fit the mold, not because he loved her. 
which is in direct contrast to everything the public can see with their own eyes. Harry and Meghan also tried to directly tarnish Catherine's image via Omid Scobie. If you don't know what that whole mess is about, I will link that video in the description box. Ultimately, Harry also took things even further when he mentioned William's children and therefore the trust is absolutely gone. And indifference has likely long since set in for William in terms of Harry. While Harold seems to still be constantly frustrated with his family's lack of response to his media games, the king has directly asked his youngest son to stop complaining publicly in an attempt to halt this continued drawn out drama, if not for his own sake and his family's sake, but for Catherine's sake. The royal family has done everything they can to stop this drama, to minimize it or eliminate any further content manufacturing from Harry and Meghan by way of never seeing them for any significant period of time, by not inviting them to things, by not being alone with them, by not having any more private conversations, by not filling them in on truly private, important family developments like the health of family members. Harry and Meghan have been cut out of the loop because they can't be trusted, because they commoditize everything they're told. And so now they've been asked nicely to stop it. Let's hope it does stop. The fact that Harry and Meghan did all of these things, and Harry specifically has so methodically driven a wedge between himself and his brother, shows a huge lack of foresight and empathy. Harry made himself known as someone who cannot put himself in someone else's shoes to see how his actions will be viewed by others, by the public, or received by his own family. He also demonstrated extreme disrespect, lack of compassion, and a self-centeredness that makes it difficult to view him or Meghan in any light other than toxic or narcissistic one. What do you think of the brothers' feud? While I'm confident that William is perfectly capable of being the bigger person and accepting Harry back into the family, forgiving Harry, I don't think he will. And I don't think he should. Because when your children, your spouse, your father, your family member, the monarchy, you know, there's so many other big picture things at play here for William. In particular, his direct family members. It becomes so much bigger than just William being the bigger person for his little brother. He likely feels it's much more important and his duty and loyalty lies with his family members to protect them, even for his own well-being, to protect himself and his family from Harry and Meghan for the sake of those who depend on him to go into that protective mode rather than to be the bigger person for his little brother who is so very small. Please leave your comments below. Thank you so very much for joining me for today's video. I hope you have a happy day ahead and I'll see you next time. Bye!